thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'll try to speak more than just about nanotech, uh, because it fundamentally describes a theme across the sciences as opposed to any one industry or product and may not deeply relate to what you're interested in. So in an attempt to try to speak in some ways uh, that would be of interest to everyone, I'm going to try to speak about a variety of industries where there's disruptive innovation. Everything from energy and clean tech to synthetic biology, which frankly is the area I'm most interested in today, um, which some might consider a subset of nanotechnology in the broad scheme of things. But let me show you uh, a uh, quick set of topics. Um, obviously, I work at a venture capital firm. I'll just show one slide as a disclaimer uh, as to what that means. But what I'm going to try to share with you today is a perspective we've learned from the entrepreneurs we've met with over the years as to why entrepreneurship exists, why venture capitalists focus on technology businesses, and why we're optimistic about the next 10, 20, and 50 years, which may be difficult to uh, fathom in a, given the last 10 years of technology business. But, uh, but I'll try to share some of our enthusiasm for the future with you today. And then we'll leave time for Q&A as well. I, I think. Exactly. And one of the main points is that sort of accelerating change, if you think of it as Moore's Law or uh, exponential progress, has uh, obviously revolutionized communications, computers, software, um, no surprise there, telecoms, what have you. But increasingly is innovating or penetrating into new markets that have been sheltered and somewhat cozy for many years. Uh, energy and clean tech perhaps being the largest of those. A trillion dollar markets now available to radical disruption. And whenever I use the word radical disruption, um, I'll try to convince you that's a positive thing. If you're a new entrant, right? if you're not IBM or, or, uh, or a large company. So um, some very broad sweeping generalizations to start, which I hope to flesh out and make more interesting. Uh, so that at the end of the day, you perhaps like me would agree that these are not just throwaway points, but are actually fundamental and um, essential to uh, what we do here in Silicon Valley. The first is that we're seeing more innovation than ever before. You know, scientists don't rest during recessions. They don't, you know, the cease and desist their productive activities. And the one overview point I can make from all the business plans we get from around the globe is that we're seeing more innovation now than ever before. Not only deeper and more interesting innovation, but much broader scope of innovation than before. Partially because our filters are wider, we're looking at more industries than we did, and we tend to have short attention spans and get distracted by new and interesting things. Um, but, but there's just more going on now than ever before. Um, it's true when you look at the university labs, the enthusiasm of undergrads studying bioengineering or what have you, the latest uh, major du jour in uh, engineering. Um, or if you talk to the entrepreneurs or anywhere up and down the chain. So that's the first point. I think there's reasons why that's the case and that, why that was the case 10 years ago and why that will be the case 10 years from now and it's true every year. It's going to feel like there's more innovation than ever before because it's an exponential growing trend. The thing that's somewhat new, uh, surprisingly new in our business is the, the rate at which it's globalizing. And for a sense of contrast, uh, when I started in venture capital in 1995, seems like a long time ago, um, in the mid to late 90s, we never met with an entrepreneur from outside the United States. Not once in the 90s. But even more amazingly, the companies we invested in, all U.S. companies, of course, only sold to U.S. customers themselves. So the startups only serviced U.S. accounts. All you cared about was U.S. startups servicing U.S. customers. And it was only about the time they were getting ready to go public that they'd set up a joint venture in Japan or maybe one in Europe to try to you know, deal with that, quote, rest of the world outside the U.S. And our Rolodex, it literally at work, had very few, I mean, only if we had an entry for country you know, in our Rolodex at work. Today, that's unfathomable, right? In the last 10 years, we've made the vast majority, you know, by a factor of 10, um, of our uh, profits from China, for example, outside of the United States. Well, globalization, I probably don't need to preach to this group. But what I just want to share with you is how dramatic it has changed, yet how slowly the venture industry itself has adapted to that change. We, yes, all look for entrepreneurs that can service global accounts. So the first thing that changed was the startups didn't wait to service global customers. They would look for customers wherever they could find them. But the venture firms have been very slow to change their footprint, where they have offices, where they are comfortable making investments. And it's, for some reason, not an easy thing to change quickly, um, partially because we're just poor at managing anything. And, and, and you know, innovating our own organizations is not something we're used to doing. But there's a sort of a, a virtual circle where entrepreneurs can be anywhere. They can service customers with lower transaction costs than ever before, thanks to the internet. And many of those network effects are mutually self-reinforcing, in that it's easier now to start a company in an emerging economy than ever before. Take Estonia, one that I um, can comment on a bit later. But it's also easier um, uh, to grow your business, to be discovered, to find capital. Uh, it's not easy, but it's easier than any point in history. Um, and it's getting better. These network effects are pretty powerful. Paul gets that point later. I, I, I'm assuming that's something everyone here understands, but it really drives globalization. Globalization reinforces network effects. The one slide I, I promised on us and our organization, for those unfamiliar, we have an unusual structure. Uh, we think much of the venture industry will eventually trend this way, which is to have um, a distributed network of funds locally managed 
local decision making, no bureaucracies or hierarchies, or central command and control. But stitched together in a federated network where every one of them is a partial equity owner in every other one. So they all, we all want the others to succeed. We share brand, obviously, and we share um, as much help as we can, Rolodex-related help, uh, helping startups uh, you know, reach customers and partners globally. There's pockets of expertise strength across this. Um, and in Q&A, I can go more into it if this interests people. I'm going to assume you're more interested in entrepreneurship trends than venture capital trends, but I'm happy to talk more about this. The one thing I can say is in the aggregate, it's about $6 billion under management, but in no one fund that's ever been a billion dollars in size. So it's a number of organization venture funds. And so the disclaimer would be, most comments I make will be from the perspective, obviously, of startups and not the perspective of large companies. But that's something we don't really have any right to speak about with authority. Now, there's just one interesting cheer, cheer up point to start uh, for the entrepreneurs in the room. If you look at the Dow Jones um, industrial average, two thirds of those companies were started during a recession or a Great Depression. It's kind of interesting. The brands you see here as well as some others. You know, and why, why might that be? There's a number of reasons. We believe just structurally and culturally it's better to form companies in down markets. You focus on customers more than investors, which is also a healthy thing. You get more time to iterate and learn from those customers before a competitive onslaught comes of highly funded competitors. And you tend to form a culture of frugality that lasts for many, many years. But there's also one other reason, which is when you have a market disruption, when everything is being thrown asunder, it's easier for new entrants to find niches that they can serve, right? If, it's, if business as usual is stable, predictable, debt financing isn't crippling companies, it's helping companies grow, the big get bigger and the small don't have a chance, right? And so it takes something like market disruption to make it possible for new car companies to compete with GM and Toyota, something that would have been unfathomable just 10 years ago. Okay, so I've used the word disruption a few times, and I do mean it as a good thing, because without this, I don't think entrepreneurs could exist, right? If you think about it in the abstract, if you're going up against a large company in their core business with a similar product, a similar price point, and just try to duke it out on execution or something, there's just no chance. The capital, brand, channels of distribution um, presence that large companies have will continue to uh, afford big, big getting bigger. And it's against that back pressure, if you will, of business as usual, that you have to find ways to change the playing field, change the chess game, if you will. So something has to be disrupted, otherwise new entrants wouldn't exist. Well, where do these come from? Well, on a periodic basis, they can come from, as I mentioned, financial crises. They can come from deregulation of an industry. It tends to happen once or twice every few decades. You know, the postal industry maybe will deregulate, maybe, you know, railways in certain economies. Or privatization, you know, related to regulation, the type of regulation change, where all of a sudden something is private industry where it wasn't before. Again, great opportunities. We always have our antenna open, or our eyes open, I guess you'd say, for those opportunities. But we can't predict or, or, or sort of base a firm on steadily looking for new forms of privatization or uh, uh, deregulation. Another major category of disruption is a new channel of distribution, new ways to reach customers. And the internet was like, you know, is and has been one of the largest ever seen of fundamentally new business models being possible because of the way you reach customers. For the older people in the room, if you remember the Dell versus Compaq wars in the early days when Compaq was the largest PC vendor and seemed invincible, yet Dell had a new way to sell direct to the customer. The channel conflict and the distribution arrangements prevented Compaq from competing with Dell head to head ever. It was almost as if their fate was written in stone. Those are the kinds of new channels that allow for new entrants. Now, beyond the internet, there's obviously mobility. It's the next big one. It's, it's already crashed well on many shores, and it's obvious, if you will. And I can't tell you what the next one is. Uh, actually, in q and I'd love any suggestions um, as to what the next channel of distribution is to reach consumers. Because again, we couldn't think of making an investment thesis that would last for the decades uh, in the future around that theme. So this is a big build-up. There's been one continual source of disruption for the past 100 years that continues for the next 100 years that we are willing to bet on. That we're willing to say, you know, in 2030, if we're forming a new venture fund, here's what we can hang our hat on. And that is accelerating technological change, nonlinear change, exponential growth uh, in technology. Now, this is one of the reasons, by the way, that you don't see venture capitalists being successful or, or frankly, dabbling much outside of technology. You know, life sciences, IT, sometimes retail, but this is a small niche in the venture industry. And frankly, if there isn't something that feels like rapidly changing technology at the core of the businesses we're investing in, we, we probably don't have good long-term long -term track records because they're not really any long-term sources of disruption to battle. Well, what's the uh, sort of the most famous example? Uh, many of you are familiar with Moore's Law, right? What's interesting is there are all these different versions of Moore's Law. Uh, accelerating computational power or speed per unit you know, cost over time. But everyone kind of colloquially kind of rubs their hands in the air and says it's kind of like a doubling of computer power every year. It's generally the gist of it. Uh, Gordon Moore never said that, but he gets credit for something fundamentally similar to that. 
he was much worse in the, in the uh, transistor uh, optimization uh, for uh, a given uh, manufacturing node in the semiconductor industry. But if you sort of take his various forecasts and smear them all together, you get something like what we call Moore's law. <laughs> but what's fascinating is what he was noticing was not anything particularly unique to the integrated circuit or the semiconductor industry at all. He was noticing a refraction of, or a reflection, a shimmering pattern of beauty, if you will, that was a refraction of a much longer term trend. So I always show this slide in every presentation I give, no matter what the subject matter or who I'm speaking to. So I can't stop that trend now. But I do always ask, how many people have seen this or something like it? Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law, which is, gosh, I think there's some shy people. I'm going to guess 20% of them, which is slightly low. So I think it's the most important graph in all technology business. And so let me briefly explain what it's showing. It's by Ray Kurzweil. You have a logarithmic scale. So every one of these is a 10,000-fold improvement, right? not arithmetic, but geometric improvement. And so a straight line on one of these kinds of graphs would be an exponential. This kind of a curve, Kurzweil, um, and actually the Santa Fe Institute is verified as well, is a double exponential. And every dot is the best price performance computer of its day. Now, what's interesting, first off, is that when you abstract what people care about when they buy Transistors. It's not no one says, hey, give me 10,000 transistors, I'll buy 50,000. Yeah, I'll have a million transistors. No, of course not. You buy a memory, and that's the closest thing to the number of transistors, like give me four gigs of flash. Um, or you buy processing power, you know, a certain speed of processor. So in this case, we're looking at processing power, $1,000 to buy, constant dollars. And um, it's the same kind of curve for storage, the two things we care about when we buy transistors. So what's fascinating first is it strikes across you know, five different technology substrates. From electromechanical mechanical device that took the U.S. Census in 1890, the relay-based computer that cracked the Nazi enigma code in World War II, the 1956 vacuum tube-based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win. Nobody knew they were fitting to a curve. It wasn't until you know the mid to late 60s that anyone even thought there was such a curve. It wasn't fashionable to say things are improving. It's fashionable to say the golden years were behind us. Now there's sort of this meme around this that progress is in fact improving our culture, and this is the, the longest-term technology business trend I've ever seen. In fact, probably the longest uh, business trend I've ever seen. Okay, so what are, now that we sort of understand what's here, and oh, by the way, there'll be other dots below the curve. This is the frontier of human capacity. We use the tools of one generation to build the next, build better CNC tools, you know, semiconductor production equipment, what have you, to produce better and better tools, better simulation tools. We use our tools as a species to build better tools. Now, yes? Would you mind speaking a little louder? It's really hard to understand. I apologize. Uh, is there any, should it be louder into the mic, or is there a way to adjust the mic? Just adjust the mic. Okay, so and also turning this way a lot. Yeah, so this side. Put money time. Yeah, good jokes. You just got to be able to hear them. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
something, again, totally decoupled from integrated circuits. It just says the idea space is compounding. That every innovation, every invention is a combination of prior inventions. There's not any one thought that just occurs out of nothingness and is brilliant. It is a combination of prior ideas that compounds within our species. And that leads, therefore, to a combinatorial growth over time of possible inventions that are ready and ripe for um, uh, sort of you know, coming to market. Things you couldn't have done 20 years ago, you can do today, given other innovations other people have made. And so that is at least one theoretical underpinning for why we see so many exponential growth in technology, or in idea space, if you will. One other point I make is, of course, that's what creates the economy over time. It's not that this is just exogenous to the economy, but innovations like this drive the economy, and that's why you tend to see economic growth over time as well. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, as Moore's Law grows, it starts, as I mentioned in my opening comments, it, it can start to affect industries, and it's kind of dark, but oh, um, that formerly weren't really used to much change. They are kind of sheltered cottage industries like the military industrial complex or automobiles that you didn't really expect new entrants to have a chance. Right? So we recently had the first IPO of a car company since Henry Ford in the US. And that, many had tried in the interim, it's just been way too hard to make a break into that, uh, into that sector. Similarly with rockets, I mean, rockets are hard. A lot of countries have tried to launch rockets into orbit. And SpaceX, uh, and, and disclosure, we are investors in many of the specific point companies that, uh, that all highlights so take that with a grain of salt. Not that they're great, but what I will share is, you know, having a first success in the Falcon 9 to orbit is relatively unprecedented for new launch vehicles. The last one in the U.S., the Atlas, it took 12 failures in a row, blown on the pad, blown up on the pad, blown up on the pad. You know, like by eighth time, you start to wonder what you're doing as an engineer. You know, first time out of the chute to orbit is a testament to the, you know, the improvements that we made in simulations, materials, the common electrical and the computational bus for every component, every actuator in the rocket. It's just a complete redesign that in many ways takes advantage of the Moore's Law, both in, in substance and in process. But there are many industries, right? So as Moore's Law reaches higher and higher thresholds, let me go back to that last slide for just one sec. As it reaches higher and higher thresholds, there, it reaches moments where the computational power is powerful enough to simulate something that was unsimulatable before. Like, um, well, we haven't quite got the weather yet. But let's say, how does a, uh, any given structure perform in a wind tunnel? You don't actually have to build wind tunnels anymore. You can simulate how a car or a plane will perform and design via uh, silica for many more rapid iterations on what would be the ideal design, what would have the lowest coefficient of drag. And yeah, maybe you put it in a wind tunnel at the end to check, or maybe do a crash test to check. But most of the design cycles are by computer. And so that's why, what I mean by um, sorry, reaching sort of thresholds where an industry changes. Now, one other factor that's loosely coupled to this, it's sort of um, a loose segue, and that's you know, another place where you see exponential curves, but it also is one that compounds many of the other curves and the dissemination of ideas and the radio ideas cross pollinate, is that the internet allows communication to occur more rapidly and transparently than ever before. So here we've I just grabbed data from a number of companies, all launched in different countries, of course, Hotmail, locally, ICQ, Israel, SkyFly, Estonia. And if you just compensate for you know, when they started, the rate at which they grew, and these two really caught our eye. It was just spooky how in lockstep they seemed to be six months staggered from each other. And both were buddy communication systems to start. Primarily, it was a secondary channel of communication with a close coterie of friends, where you sort of told a couple friends, and they told a couple friends, and so on and so on. And that sort of defined the viral growth of those two businesses. It caught our attention. We spent a lot of you know, time thinking about viral marketing in the late 90s uh, and looked for that in companies like Skype and others that we invested in. They set all kinds of records in you know, capital efficiency and all kinds of stuff that I'm sure you've heard before and I won't belabor now. The main points for today's talk that I want to emphasize are that these kinds of curves are inherently global. It, you know, these, these customers were everywhere. These companies were everywhere. No one needed to know where they came from. And that's increasingly true for more and more companies and, and, I, might, and I dare say even countries that in some ways you could do a generalization that the, the benefits that accrue to new entrants in disruptive environments also accrue to new economies, small economies. You know, the big would still get bigger. The superpowers would just continue to get bigger. And new countries wouldn't have much of a chance as well if you didn't have disruption. That's a bit of a digression. Let me um, say something about Europe last year. There was a natural experiment. These things are the kinds of experiments you can't run on purpose because you get sued. Um, but when they happen, it's interesting to study and be prepared to study what happens so when airports shut down in Europe for five days, uh, for much of Europe, and complete chaos reigns on the ability to get places. Well, what happens? And so I asked, I didn't this at Skype, are you guys tracking this? What's going on? And sure enough, in those five days, they registered an incremental 20 million more video call minutes, equivalent to 40,000 flights going between London and New York in terms of total time people were spending that they weren't otherwise spending online. And they're increasingly, um, 
then this is growing at about 40% uh, video calls, not just uh, 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 voice. And there's over 400 million users. As we know, it's an exciting story. It's spinning out of eBay, uh, looking to go public again. And finally, we'll be untethered from being part of a big multinational company. So this company, unfortunately, has been hindered for the last few years by being part of eBay in that they haven't been able to freely compete in global markets, which may sound like a strange comment. But when you have multi million dollar interest in a given geography and some telco tells you, no, 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 we don't want you to do X, Y, or Z, your existing business is at risk, you don't do things like the obvious, which is put Skype on handsets. The founding vision of the company was never to offer voice on a computer, which is a silly idea. It was to offer handsets. These are Europeans, of course. <laughs> it was the dream. This was the, the prototyping test bed that got loose on the internet and is Skype as we know it today. And it, of course, it's the, you know, the, the, fear, the fear of death from existing telcos. Um, that has kept them from spreading uh, as rapidly as they can when they're a free company. So I'm really excited about them being free again. We're not investors in the, uh, in the new company, so that's perhaps one and only time that will be completely objective. Um, <laughs> another company, I, I, you know, this is a loose segue, but when you think about the ways in which um, innovative technology, actually, I'll go back to this picture for a second. You know, Skype, Hotmail, ICQ, they, in a way, they're, they're kind of green tech companies. I mean, to the extent you literally avoid travel, it's, it's one of the largest CO2 emitters and greenhouse gas emitters. Um, and one of the most damaging ones on the planet. But it's staggering how much, not only do you, you know, save the environment, but facilitate human communications and change the, the, uh, um, the uh, entrepreneurial landscape through better communication tools. Well, another example, just in general, of advantages of Skype's architecture and things like it is that when you have a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, it's also inherently more green. And that you, use, you can use waste cycles striped across a number of desktops and not build those data centers. So there's a little, kind of, and one of the reasons I also mention this company is because it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, in terms of, does anyone know where the development team for, for a while it is? Just like Skype's development team was all in Estonia, but they had a couple of management guys that ran around. So the entire team there is in Serbia. And, you know, who would know, who needs to know? But they're great programmers. They built a completely distributed file system, distributed um, um, search engine. So no crawlers, no servers, no cost. That um, you, can, you can give it a spin. It gets all the recent search results. It gets the social web. It gets the deep web. It gets all that free. Because it watches where people surf as opposed to the links and the structure of it's harder to gain and you don't get spam either. But the point was that when they analyze what it costs for them to offer search versus other smaller companies, and you take like a mid-sized internet company, a uh, mid-sized, let's say, uh, Facebook from a few years ago, or um, you know, a growing uh, internet company, it can make a pretty big difference um, whether you build these enormous data centers where they're asking for these 100 megawatt plants and quotes in the desert, all the new, they're very, you know, when Facebook or um, Google wants to build a new data center, they're very quiet about it because the sheer uh, energy consumption of one of the data centers is, you know, potentially cause lots of blood dust. Wow, that's almost possible to see, but that's okay. Um, a segue to energy and clean tech. Um, Moore's law in compounding accelerating change does not directly apply to all clean tech markets by any means. It certainly doesn't apply to things like solar cells. Just sort of a disclaimer. Uh, some people might think, oh, it's silicon solar cells, so this should be like Moore's law, but it's not. But there are areas that look a lot like internet companies and internet uh, economics. So one example, um, well, the smart grid is one area, um, a bunch of companies working in that area, but Enternot, which went public, and therefore the, the data is out, and you can, you can publicly analyze how well they're doing, is a very interesting example of what you can do using the internet in new trillion dollar markets. So what they do is they aggregate uh, industrial energy generation and um, load shedding opportunities. So over the internet, they can turn on a diesel genset, if need be, at some hospital, they could lower the temperature in a Walmart chiller in some retail location, maybe dim the lights in some other location. Those industrial customers have signed up, they get paid every month for this option, to give this option through and not to the utilities to say, during an almost brownout period, shed load, turn on gensets, do whatever it takes, aggregate industrial capacity, avoid the brownout. Well, it's a and the money flows every month to the industrial accounts um, that participate in that program just to, to sell that option. So because they have that option, they don't have to build these peaking power plants, these natural, uh, natural gas-fired power plants that are only turned on a few times a year when you would otherwise have a brownout. And already on the East Coast, there have been 80 of those plants that have not been built simply because of internet existing. So the virtualization, if you will, over the internet, only possible because of the network topology and the data networks um, uh, sort of ubiquity, um, has had a major impact on real construction of plant equipment on the East Coast. One splash slide, um, more bait for Q&A if anyone's interested, but we've been investing quite actively, I think more, at least last time it was tallied last year, more so than any other venture group in what's broadly called energy and clean tech. We started on this side of the page and have been more and more interested on the right side of the page. So generation, things like wind and solar, of course, batteries, um, or sort of distribution, smart grid, things of that sort. 
uh, batteries and storage, grid, grid side storage in particular. More efficient use, you know, from solid state lighting to building materials, what have you. Uh, fuels and chemicals, usually bio, bio generated, and, um, and recycling and reuse. Everything from Kaima in Israel, which figured out how to double up the DNA in plants so that they um, really express sort of the archetype of the species and grow faster with less water use. Or Oasis Water, which does forward osmosis and water purification. It's pretty exciting companies. If I aggregate across all of them, they did about 200 and so million in revenue three years ago, about, excuse me, two years ago, uh, about um, 500 million last year, no, excuse me, 750 million, I can't remember, 750 million last year and about 1.4 billion this year, according to plan today. So real revenue growing really rapidly, and some of them, like Solar City, have grown more quickly than any company we've ever invested in. So it's not just, um, I guess, a lot of hype. Um, there's, there's some real substance behind some of the companies. Now, mm -hmm. I, um, <laughs> I'm obviously a little biased here. I mean, this is a little too dark to read, but there was this great uh, uh, license plate that went on the internet a few weeks ago, about LOL oil. You know, let's just laugh. <laughs> and and uh, I was talking yesterday with a bunch of executives from Castrol, um, which is one of the largest motor oil <laughs> you know, companies. They only sell products into, into combustion engines. And that, the whole industry is convinced that it's just going to be, you know, we're going to be burning oil and gas for like 200 years, they thought. I, I just couldn't believe the rate at which they thought this industry was going to change. And I, I, I was the expressed opinion that there is massive disruption in vehicles and that all cars will eventually be electric. It's not a question of if, but when. Those gas-burning cars that we drive today waste 80% of the energy in heat. 80% is waste heat. And only 0.3% of that energy that is consumed in your car moves the people. It is astoundingly inefficient. The electric car is very different. Even if we did the dumbest thing possible, which is pump oil out of the ground and run it in a plant, burn the oil in a plant to generate electricity over transmission lines into the batteries, it'd still be better for everything, the economy, efficiency. It's still a better way to go. And of course, we won't do that. Um, a nuclear future, it also seems inevitable, in my opinion. And we don't have any investments in nuclear, so that's also completely unbiased. Steve? Yeah. A little less mumbling, maybe? Mumbling. Uh, so it's sort of like rum, 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 kind of sound. Mumbling. You have an air conditioner, right? Yeah, you have an air conditioner. So enunciate. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, this, that was all. That wasn't really important. Um, I think the main takeaway is that there's a major transition in electric vehicles going on. And it's not just the high-end flagship cars like this, which can be dismissed as expensive and, and what have you. Although the total cost of ownership for this sedan will be less than the Ford Taurus. It's starting to, you know, starting to get more mainstream. It drives unlike any other car and can seat seven and will be unlike any car ever made. Net, yes, yeah, so five inside, two rear facing in the back. has you know, full trunk space in the front. There's no motor. The entire drive, it's all batteries, motor, the whole thing is below the wheel line. So it handles like a boat rather than an SUV flipping over. And um, the entire motor, gearbox, and inverter fits in a space about this big. The entire thing. No smog checks, no oil changes. It's just, having driven one for two years, I'll never buy a you know, gas burning car again. Um, but that's the high end, easily dismissed. What's really interesting, and I don't know if the cash flow folks realized this when I spoke with them yesterday, is that in China today, there are 120 million electric vehicles driving around. Today, 120 million, sold by 1,300 different vendors. <gasps> now, not 40, <laughs> two wheel, two wheel drives, e-bikes and scooters, things that replace, replace the best of life um, uh, vehicles. It has been an explosion of usage over there that people don't quite realize. And you know, the pinchers on this industry um, are coming from the below and from the top, right? So the high-end companies like Tesla establish the coolness, the brand, the performance, and people are willing to spend a lot of money for high gross margin products, and that's a, a sheltered space for new entry. The bottom up is usually where disruption really occurs. And it's the Clayton Christensen kind of analysis. Where do you get disruptive uh, advances? Usually somebody at the bottom, you know, making a cheap, you know, throwaway product that you kind of ignore. It's like, why would I drive that? I don't need to worry about that if I'm a car company. And at the high end, like, well, those are expensive cars. Those are hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's also not my worry. That's a niche I don't have to worry about. That, that's the classic source of disruption. Now, how did this happen in China? Is this readable? Yeah, no, pretty much. This is a summary of, of analysis by Jonathan Weiner, and I've added the most recent data from 2009. What happened was, over this time period, there were both improvements in technology, um, economic buying power, and policy. So the, they went to brushless motors. They got a big bump in efficiency, 50 to 80% motor efficiency. They went to VRLA batteries, more efficient there, about a 33% bump. You had about a doubling of purchasing power, free purchasing power um, by consumers. But what's interesting, uh, and E2W, sorry, two wheel, electric two wheels. That's both the e-bikes and the scooters. But what's interesting is some policy changes. First, there was this big announcement. We're going to do e-bikes. We've got to do it. We have all these two-cycle motorcycles and little Vespas. They're just horrible. They're polluting like crazy. We're choking in our city, frankly. So we're obvious to the West that they could smell it every day. 
So they first launched them. They banned scooters in several cities. Up to it, it started to spread and propagate from some of the large cities. Over 150 cities banned them outright. So you want a gas-powered two-wheeler? No, can't have one. Then they uh, started giving them access to the bike lanes, kind of like the commute lane here in the U.S. And they, um, and, and in some cases there have been some changes recently, but it's sort of beyond that now. There's there, there in some cases banning, you know, reverting back on the laws, but the, the sort of cats out with that. What's interesting is one of the biggest bumps here, and nothing to do with any of that policy. Does anyone know what was the big well, action? Oh, would you? Unless someone wants to throw their hand up, what the biggest boom for the e-bikes and scooters was? Is actually SARS. Interestingly, the people did not want to get on the bus or any form of mass transit, and this was, in fact, a cheaper way to get around once they looked into it than the bus. And that, by the way, is even if you take into account that they have to replace batteries after a year or two. So most people think this is the cost, because that's the cost out the door. So that's just these too cheap to meter, in their opinion. And even, but even if you do a good enough accounting, it's cheaper than riding the bus. Interesting, from the bottom end. Now, 1,300 vendors. The four biggest ones are making cars. So these little, these cars don't go very fast, like 40, 50 miles an hour, and they don't have much range, about well, you know, 40 miles of range. But in the city, they work just great. And so the idea that, you know, all this is, you know, 200 years off, I think China will hit a 20% PV threshold a lot sooner than anyone believes. So change is happening. Oh, by the way, if you look back in history in the US, in 1900, the single largest source or consumption of electricity on the grid was the transportation and industrial motors and industrial sectors number two. So it's not inconceivable that we will recapitulate what we went through in 1900 when most car companies were electric. Now, accelerating change. One last anecdote and I'm going to do a quick time check. Yeah, I need to um, wrap it up with time for questions. Then. I'll try to do this more quickly. Let me think how I can do that. I'll speak more quickly. Um, <laughs> There is a lot going on in life sciences, almost a renaissance of learning. And in many ways, it's driven entirely by Moore's Law. The ability to sequence genomes more quickly was enabled entirely and directly by Moore's Law and the technique of shotgun sequencing that depends on it. But there are a number of areas outside of IT where this accelerated pace of change is almost identical over hundreds of millions of years in evolution itself and our latest exp expansion and extension of evolution uh, through our technologies. Proteins crystallized, you can see it there on that graph, you know, predicted 35 years ago to 0.5% accuracy today on an exponential curve. MRI and other brain imaging technologies, and then there are genes map. Genes map is interesting because it's sort of a great catch-all for how much inf how information is compounding in this field that uh, you can compare across generations and across uh, techniques. So I'll show you a quick curve on that. Human Genome Project, made possible by computers. Half the project was done in the last year, it was a 10-year effort because every year they got twice as quick on the computer. So by definition, you're going to have to done in the last year, right on schedule. Everyone was a naysayer until it was done. And these curves tend to catch people by surprise in that regard. And you might have thought, oh, people will take a rest, you know, digest for a while, and just have a human genome. What, that's more interesting and more viable than that. Well, the scientists like Craig Venner and others move on to microbes. And this curve on the right, so this curve, is there. And this is what's happened since then. Well, not entirely. I've left the last couple of years off. Because you might then say, well, gosh, you couldn't possibly continue up to the building's roof here. Um, why would, well, what would you do next? And in the last 12 months alone, Craig Venner has grown this curve of 10x. So this is the 10% point of where we are today. And what he realized is he could use the same computational forward-looking thought to say, okay, we can reassemble the human genome from a bunch of random fragments computationally. You know, we don't know which way they're oriented and what's partially overlapping and from different people. And we'll just let the computer figure it all out. That sort of leap of faith, he now extended to an entire ecosystem. So he did a great boondoggle sailing around the uh, ocean waters, sampling seawater about every 200 miles, and shotgun sequencing the entire uh, basket of microbes that live there. And there'd be about 10 million viruses in a, um, and 1 million bacteria in each of the little samples that they gathered. So huge ecosystems. And they found huge diversity out there, all kinds of learning. They grew the number of genes associated with energy transduction and harvesting 100-fold. So all kinds of interesting chlorophyll-like genes and things. Anyway. Um, the realization was we can just use the computers to figure out what are the interesting genes that look like other genes and, and grow the data sets, but we lose the organisms. We never bothered to sort what was what. We just threw the whole bath in and lost it. Right? So why would you ever do that? Why would you ever want the code without the host organism? Because in biotech, to this day, if you wanted to do any gene splicing, you physically have to cut and paste the genes. You needed the gene of the host organism to be able to do any useful cut and paste work. Well, that, he saw, was all changing. Specifically, another exponential curve. I won't explain the axes other than to say all that matters is the slope. The red one, Moore's Law. The blue one, the cost of gene sequencing, reading the code of life. Green, cost of gene synthesis, which is a new thing, writing the code of life from scratch. 
literally building up DNA from the ground up with no animals involved. That cost, by the way, when you have a slope difference like this, is a dramatic difference. If we put these on non-logarithmic paper, it would make Moore's Law look flat compared to the pace of progress in gene synthesis. Well, what do we literally mean? There's labs all over the country, just email them file. Give me an A, T, G, G, C, A, whatever. So, and then just FedEx you those oligonucleotides. 20, 30 letters long, you can catenate them together, usually using yeast to stitch it together. Bigger and bigger things. And so you could predict, given nice cost curves, when would the first virus be synthesized? Sure enough, 2002, first virus synthesized. You know, that happened to be polio. Then it goes along 2010, the first living organism that's reproducing whose parents are a computer. Pretty bold achievement that took place this year. You literally take out 100% of the DNA in an organism, take that cadaver, stick in a completely foreign bolus, and change it into a different species. Completely different animal. That's been done. And that gives us complete right authorship authority to whatever genetic code we want to put in there. Um, now, we don't know what to write. That's the big problem. We're borrowing from nature still. But it is, today, a provocative and profound advance in the process of innovation. Not what bug you build. But how quickly can you build them? How quickly can you run experiments? How, how, you know, how much authorship flexibility do you have on where exactly do you want to splice the gene in? Because I mean, they can embed, and they have websites and text. They do develop an ASCII code, if you will, for, for DNA. Mm -hmm. It's non-coding, so you just put whatever words and watermarks you want in there, and you literally have base parallel uh, precision. Now, what, what kind of opportunities does that present? It's, it's a process advantage. I mean, George Church at Harvard recently showed he could create four billion genetic variants in a single day. Billion variants. For high throughput experimentation, it's unheard of. Now, a different methodology he uses is a bit more random, but Venner believes also will soon be able with robotic processes to do a purposeful design, uh, at least somewhat purposeful, across a wide space. Well, you know the field has become mainstream when kids are doing it. So teenagers all over the world, uh, Slovenia I think was a winner this year, um, enter this International Genetic Engineering Machines competition. We take E. coli and reprogram it like this. And they literally think of them as like Lego bricks. They have these little um, three ring binders with block paper and you punch out um, genes that you splice into E. coli that have defined functional blocks, kind of like, like, more like Lego's Mindstorm NXT than, than you know, inanimate blocks. But nevertheless, um, they just don't even think twice about this. They reprogram them to smell better at the start because they smell like that from which they come. And they um, made them into like arsenic sensors and uh, have them like flashlights or change pigments. They did, created biofilms, which are naturally forming films of bacteria that would move pigment based on exposure to light, sort of like an E. coli, as I would call it. And, and just all kinds of stuff. You know, binary uh, things where one organism triggers through its quorum sensing pathways uh, activity in another one, and that dyad is both a sensor and therapeutic for Crohn's disease. Um, early, it hasn't been in animal trials yet, but still, amazing stuff being done by teenagers around the world. On the business side, companies like Static Genomics and a bunch of others are, you know, pursuing through chemical partnerships a whole variety of fuels and chemicals. We take waste, CO2, um, municipal waste, uh, all kinds of things, uh, glycerin, waste glycerin from industrial processes and turning it into valuable fuels and chemicals. And, you know, just keep in mind, about everything you can touch in this room is made from oil. And um, one day it won't be. So big companies like uh, ExxonMobil plowed $600 million into a project to uh, re-engineer algae so that it continuously secretes oils across the cell membrane. You just skim them off so you don't have to kill the algae. You can farm and continue this process, which would change the economics of that. And I'll leave with just one uh, last, on the bio point, just one last uh, provocative point about, you know, okay, we have this great capability. How do you build what you want to build? And this, I think, is... An observation that transcends almost any complex system you want to build, whether it's um, re-engineering um, or building a new microbe, whether it's programming software that's more complex than, let's say, Windows or an operating system today, whether it's building um, um, an artificial intelligence in the future. I think there's an open discussion of how can you design such a thing if it's more complex than we can understand. And the answer that clearly comes from many different avenues is that you can evolve things that are beyond human comprehension. This is done in simple algorithmic search. This is done in um, antenna design. Um, and in this case, this company, Genomatica, wanted to create a chemical that no microbe makes. This is not found in nature. It's uh, a precursor plastic for um, automotive dashboards and spandex. So we all have green pants one day if we choose to wear those fibers. Nevertheless, um, they, first they modeled 40,000 different pathways by which you could make this. 40,000 different ways the microbe could make the chemical they want, including chemistries that aren't found in nature but are real chemistries. Um, so they don't have to just take what nature has so far delivered. They then used their best engineering skills kind of in a Germanic sense and, and after many months of effort found a five-fold improvement in the yield of the chemical they were trying to make. So that was sort of the, the, the mainstream approach. 
you know, where they optimize it. Like, what is going to be the least carbon usage and the least ATP per unit of molecule out? You know, just, just think like an engineer would. Another team in the same company said, I'm just going to selectively cripple this organism so it can't eat anything but the sugar. And has, it is a really weak and, and powerless organism, but the only way it can survive and want to reproduce is if it happens to one of its pathways to make the chemical I want as a byproduct. And it's only a trickle of byproduct, and the bugs mainly died because they were so crippled. And then all they do is skim the fastest growers week after week, just take the fastest growers. And after two months, they had 20,000 fold improvement yield and they're ready for a product release. They don't understand how the bug works, don't need to, right? They understand the process. What for the next bug, which, you know, how do we want to tweak the selection parameters? How do we want to tweak the sim life, if you will, of, of, of the game, not the game's outcome? Which is also very interesting from a process perspective because this organism then, when shifted to a large scale production, in theory, should continue to improve over time, not drift from its goal. So many other biotech um, uh, or genetically modified organisms in industrial plants, you have to flush the whole batch every few months because they evolve away from what you want. You know, like, I want this chemical and I want to reproduce and you know, live, live large. You know, describing some intent of their life. Um, and so they tend to evolve away. Any mutation, more precisely, any mutation that shuts down a wasteful process of making chemicals you don't care about would be favored, and therefore the learning things quickly evolve away from doing what you want. These guys just get better and better at doing what you want. So you in a sense design for evolvability. And I think that's the future of computer science as well when it comes to complex systems. In fact, the closing chapter of the computer science book from a famous computer scientist who's evolved software programs to sort numbers and has experimented both in traditional design and evolutionary design. He concludes that the big design and engineering task of our future is maybe to build things that go beyond what we can understand. Two last slides. Stepping back for a moment. I think because of all the accelerating change in the world, Nicholas Tell from Lebanon, I think, stated it well. He, he defines a black swan as an event that has a profound impact. No one saw it coming, but after the fact, everyone saw it coming. Right? It's like, ah, you know, oh yeah, of course, it's retrospectively rational. but caught everyone by surprise. The financial crises are classic examples of that. He predicted those without saying which one it would be. But just the fact that there are going to be more financial crises. So I mean, the takeaway from a lot of these trends on the economy is it's not like we're going through a rough patch and things are going to get normal again in a few years. It's just going to get more rough. And that we should be prepared for that in how we you know, think about taking risks in our careers, um, building portfolios in technology, and um, trying to capture the upside when you get a positive black swan, um, which is, I think, what a lot of venture firms try to do say, you know, one company out of 20 is going to really succeed in ways that I could never have predicted. One example of that in, in computer science, just if we, if we think IT is dead, everything that could be invented in basic computing has been, just one tantalizing example of quantum computers, a company up in Canada is in the process of selling their first system to a U.S. defense contractor. Um, Google's also used it to improve the image search. Basically, they are building and shipping quantum computers. These are completely different ways of building computers where you can almost think of it as registers um, where the bits are not one or zero, but one and zero simultaneously. It's a very gross, crude simplification, but you can compute that more and more quickly. If you register a thousand of these in, again, crude simplification, you could explore a thousand variations on potentially uh, the lock, you know, the key to a lock, if you will, a digital lock, um, instantaneously. Now, what's interesting about this, um, and in q and I can dive in if anyone actually wants to go to details, but let me just give you a sense of the pace of progress here. So in the last seven years, they've been doubling the number of qubits every year, up to about 128 today. And by the way, when Moore, Gordon Moore did his first Moore's Law, he had four data points in his curve. He's like, four data points, there's the curve. Right. So we have seven. So who knows if it's really a curve or just a blip. If the next seven years continue at the same pace as the past, so just seven more years, a computer that fits in a corner of this room would have more computational power for certain tasks, tasks like traveling salesman problem, route optimization, um, problems that are real in business and are, are places where we just don't do computations today. Molecular thought and modeling, you know, actually modeling exactly how a protein will fold and getting it right from Schrodinger's equations. In any case, kinds of problems that are just beyond computation today, so not Excel spreadsheets, but the tough stuff. That's the preamble. For those kinds of problems, these computers that wouldn't cost that much, relatively speaking, would outperform all computers on Earth ever built and that will ever be built, no matter how good you are at building them using any traditional architecture. So any Van Neumann machine, anything Intel ever could conceive of, if it's not a quantum computer, this one would outperform it. And oh, by the way, you can give those classic computers the entire length of the universe to work on the problem. They still won't solve the problem. They just won't get to the answer. That's the, the, the frame-breaking difference of a quantum computer for certain tasks. Okay, so hopefully I left you with that. Oh my god, what the hell is that? Um, 
Because it, it makes my noodle every time. And by the way, the only theory that explains how it works is that it engages uh, interactions between parallel universes, it, as if it wasn't weird enough. And it's a four millikelvin operation temperature, which is colder than anywhere in space. Okay, so it's very strange to do. That aside, whether it succeeds or fails, it is, I believe the most important point I tried to make today is that we are in an era of accelerating technological change. We always have been. It's just we're starting to really notice it now. And that's not likely to change. There's no reason why it would change. The ideas that compound upon each other are only growing combinatorially. And oh, by the way, they're most powerful and they're interdisciplinary. You kind of think of it as like um, differential immunity, like when a virus is introduced to a new continent or an organism crossing back in the old days when the continents were separate, you know, smallpox spreads in South America. When you, when you have isolated domains of intellectual activity in systems vernacular that has evolved from apart from one another, like biology and IT, for many years, and they finally cross pollinate again, it's a, a place where ideas have sex, and you have all kinds of radical innovations that change the world coming out of it. So this is why almost all the ideas that really make a difference come at the boundaries between academic disciplines, not from the warmth of the center of the academic discipline itself. IT, as it gets more and more powerful is now finally impacting what we think to be really big markets, not just the $100 million markets and the billion dollar markets that we saw in the past. For the first time ever in the venture business, trillion dollar markets, water purification alone, is a trillion dollar market. And this, this accelerating pace of change is, is the one thing we can keep adding on year after year after year. It's always going to be there for us. And we think, therefore, it is always a good time for entrepreneurs, but it's just getting better. And when the economy is in the, in the business, it's even better still. So I'll end it with that. And uh, I did go over, I apologize. Yes. Do we have time for questions or should we wrap up? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Sebastian and I work at the startup called Skater. Um, if there's a call to action, what would that be? For whom? For us. For us? For us? Yeah, for us in the audience. That's a great question. I like that question. Um, I guess it would be to not give up if everyone around you says this is a bad time to be thinking about doing a startup or inventing, uh, especially since you appear to be young. Um, you, you're, you know, really what the future has to, of our nation and world. Have, you know, you're, you're the people we're betting on, you know, collectively and symbolically. In that. Um, I'll get to that point in a second about youth, but, but let me first try to answer the question, which is um, those who are experienced in any given industry or um, have wisdom tend not to uh, be as encouraging. It's more rare um, for brash action and, and disruptive change. It, it, um, it's something I, would, I guess the main point would be to encourage that. And, and whether you're in a scientist in the field of scientists or an entrepreneur starting a company, you know, folks in their late 20s and early 30s statistically form most of the important changes. Right. And it, uh, it's really remarkable. If you look at IT companies, for example, that have had over a billion dollars of value for more than a decade, so they've lasted and they've been valuable. They almost all were started by teenagers or guys in their early 20s, people in their early 20s. Dell, Apple, Cisco, Microsoft, Google. You know, it just keeps going on and on. It's, it's, it's kind of staggering. Um, and they tend to stick with it. I mean, another thing I guess I'd say is no matter what some investor or other parent-like figure might say about um, the need for uh, adult supervision or season management, but actually those companies that do well also tend to be run by the founders. So, Apple's the great example of, you know, looking at the, you know, A-B test. Um, but it, it also, you know, to be fair, uh, leads to some flame-outs of companies, but that's what it's all about. It's continuing to take risks. I think mainly because if you, you know, the founders of companies tend to have that passion and want to change the world and they're willing to, if you will, proverbially roll the dice even when there's a modicum of success because they haven't achieved their life mission yet. And financially sort of oriented, arbitrage seeking opportunists, if you will, the sort of banker mentality. So like, hey, this is the right business decision, let's cash out. And, and they often mortgage their, their future because when you sell your business early, you never really go to buy it from a big company and they're just going to either sit on it or you'll, either you become their business like PayPal um, or they just kind of you know, screw it up for years like Skype. Or, Still, uh, sorry, we have yeah. a couple of questions from our yeah. LinkedIn group, so let me just read one. How long do you think it will be before lab technology matures enough to be competitive with CFL? With, with uh, LEDs and LED. with compact fluorescence. Um, wow, it's like they're ready on I, mean, I think. So it's a it's question of where you're looking in the market, but basically uh, solid state lighting, for those not intimate in this field, is the future. 
the Department of Energy estimates that in the next 25 years, we will cut worldwide consumption of electricity in half in all markets, all economies, because we're going to switch to LED lights. Um, these are, even these fluorescent bulbs are like toaster ovens um, that emit a little light uh, on the side. And the, you know, the HVAC and just sheer weight, it's kind of like the car engine, it's just, that is the future. So the quick, the quick answer would be, if you're looking to get involved with something in lighting, unless you have a short career horizon, you're like, I want to just do what's best for the next five years, you, you would ignore everything but LED lighting. And the big unsolved problems in a number of LED um, markets is cooling. I, I, you, ironically, even though they're so much more efficient, the, the light outputting area is so intense that you still have a cooling problem that it's not true. Sorry. And there's also some questions up front. <coughs> yeah. Hi, Steve. Uh, my name is Shani. I'm the founder of Value and uh, calling from the business school. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, <laughs> I actually met a couple of months ago then. Uh, my question is, you mentioned earlier in the presentation that during recession, that actually innovation and, and disruption is agnostic to recession and even accelerated during recession. Yeah, and sorry, um, company, uh, forming new companies can be easier in some cases, and the ones that survive are healthier in recessions, but the recession doesn't accelerate and but on the other hand, you clearly see that the early stage uh, capital market are definitely uh, not aligned with that. So, do you see any patterns uh, to establishing uh, these types of companies during recession that are different from any other time, uh, like either more bootstrapping mm -hmm. or, or any other patterns? That's a great question. Um, those. Um, as familiar as he is with what's going on in the venture world, there's a lack of capital. Right? So the one thing that really hurts entrepreneurs right now is that venture firms are, you know, either shocked or paranoid or you know, or just pessimistic and or just lazy. I'm not sure why, but they're not investing like they should be. So um, given the lack of capital for startups, it's both. Um, okay, to your question, yes, you need to bootstrap more, but more specifically is finding ways to engage with customers earlier and have an iterative process with those customers. So for some businesses that need a certain slug of money, you know, tens of millions of dollars, to build a production facility, that's the toughest one, right? But what they're doing is partnerships where they'll give up a geography. Let's take biofuels or, or uh, industrial chemicals as an example on my mind. You know, you give up an, uh, a geography like Peru, you know, with an exclusive deal where they fund your plant and maybe you share profits 50-50 and they'll fund the plant. And that's, you know, you have to think of a deal like that. You wouldn't think, I'm going to go raise 50 million from venture capitalists because it's just it's impossible in that in some of these sectors, um, and, and that's an overstatement. But if that's kind of if that's if, if you don't think it's an option, and it largely is a difficult option, then you, you got to you got to route around that problem. And what's beautiful about that is you know when the sources of capital are your customers, you listen to them. You don't listen to your investors, and it just tends to build a better business. You don't have ten other competitors doing the same thing. You know you can get the exclusive in both directions because no one else is knocking on their door in that particular niche industry. I'm thinking of as an example. And so um, companies like Hewlett Packard, it was that engagement with Disney for the first audio oscillator. There's, there's some critical relationship you form earlier with a customer that you otherwise couldn't. Now, in some sectors like you know, consumer internet, it's more obvious, you know, made in angel funding, getting a product out with only enough money to show that it works and then being able to raise money because that will break through <coughs> the noise, right? So a Foursquare, or a Twitter, you name it, they don't have trouble fundraising, right? Anything but. Um, and the challenge is just when you think you've got that next company that's just that great, is there a way to have a few hundred thousand dollars get you to release? And obviously, it's better than ever before. With the web services architectures and running on EC2 or whatever, you can cobble things together like never before. I mean, it's, even, it's much easier than it was in the late, late 90s to build just about anything that you dream of on the internet. So, depending on the sector, right, I try to give an example from the most ephemeral to the most hardcore you know, steel pipes in the ground. Um, there are ways to work around the shortage of funding from the venture industry. Was here. So just a follow-up to his question. So just his general advice for young or youngish entrepreneurs. You, know, you, you said you know just now that you know, a lot of great ideas come from the, the next generation, the younger generation. But you know, <coughs> you know as well as everyone in this room, that VCs want to invest in people with track record. You know, which by definition, probably Thanks. people closer, you know, a lot older than people who started Facebook or Microsoft or Steve Jobs when they started out. So just an example, while you were speaking, you know, you were talking about LEDs. And so I have a startup, you know, we have 15 patents. We, we think we solve this cooling problem for LEDs. Mm -hmm. We basically developed some called LEMs, basically turn 
ordinary glass into a light source. Mm -hmm. But you know, you don't have a track record, you don't have a patent, so well, how do we get around, how did like Facebook get around this? How did Google get around this? You know, it's like a common, I think it's common for everyone like me or anyone who's an entrepreneur and not uh, in their 40s. I wanted to make a glib remark about Facebook. When the movie comes out, he'll do it. <laughs> Twitter and Facebook are hilarious stories. It really is. Um, so you can take your question and say, you know, in what if you were just completely uh, lit at the same time, happy to get funding. So the, um, uh, I, I disagree actually with the beginning part of the question because I think every example you mentioned was venture um, Every one of them. Right, so how, did, how did they do how did, right, so, so we can do it as well. I actually think there's... There are some folks, myself and others included, the number of the venture capitalists at Sequoia, um, for example, who have no problem with youth and, and mastery of a subject. So, and I'll get to patents in a moment, because that's the only negative thing I heard in your question that would make me go to the Maybe that is or isn't something that, maybe that's the issue. So on the youth side, um, if it's not an excuse, right, if it's something where you, you might not have any business, I don't know your background, but you might not have any business experience. It might come across as naive in certain meetings, and, and that's something I need to learn. But it's not because you're young. It's, there's a little bit of experience can go a long way when you're smart and you learn quickly. I mean, even some jobs can make a difference in how much you understand about certain business processes, how product marketing works, or how the sales team the compensation system works. You only need a few months to pick that up. You don't really need a whole career in, in that field. And so, um, so without getting into your specific background, um, all those people are pretty diverse. I mean, someone like Steve Jobs at 19, you know, he just was cobbling stuff together. And what he could speak knowingly to Mark and others about was, hey, you know, customers are, I've been to the, the, the hobbyist clubs, they're, they're paying X amount for these little kits they cobble together. We can give them one that's better. And look at this, it's color graphics. Look at the walls can do. I mean, you know, and, and somebody, the light bulb clicks, and like, you know, yeah, you've never managed anything. And, and, but you're a good speaker. Think of Jobs, right? You get, you have this infectious enthusiasm that gets me hopping out of my seat for whatever it is he's translating, right? And that, and that's been true throughout his career. It's, it's endemic to how he communicates. And so the entrepreneurs that convey that passion, enthusiasm, and excitement for what they're doing, and oh, by the way, happen to be doing something in a market that has the investor side, can break across that barrier. Um, a se second order question would be, you know, at some point, does it feel like management needs to be glommed on? And do, you, do you do that yourself organically or, you know, or, or what? You know, so Google went through a really tough transition um, between investors and the entrepreneurs in, in bringing on a CEO. Um, it was not an easy process. Um, and so there's some famous examples out there of that being a tense and difficult conversation. It doesn't always have to go that way. Um, right? Again, many of those companies didn't bring on CEOs. L.A. Ellison and others um, bring presidents under them as opposed to uh, CEOs over them. So, the patent thing, the only thing I wanted to mention that in passing is that you know, relying on patents is to say, here's our asset, that could be a red flag, which is for its worth. I'll, I'll just share that. And that um, any idea, almost any idea that you can think of that has been simultaneously invented by at least two people in the same year, if not the same month. And this goes back to almost everything you could imagine that has been invented. And so the, if you just take that as a given, whether you believe it or not, there's a new book coming out by Kevin Kelly that, that summarizes a bunch of this, what technology wants. I just read that chapter, so it's very right, right in my mind. Um, in any case, um, assume that the patent's not going to protect you, but more important is what's the business case for how you take the idea you have that a few others have, which has got to be a safe assumption, and run with it and iterate quickly with the market and grow business. And if you can paint that picture, then the fact that you're young shouldn't be a problem, because the fact that you can paint that picture will be impressive. Okay. I don't think so. And, and the reason is uh, hydrogen uh, is an energy storage technology. And uh, there may be, and I haven't thought about this much, but perhaps for locomotives and long haul trucks, there may be uh, hydrogen. Uh, but I think the question of the products, and that's why I think EVs are just so much uh, more efficient. Uh, you don't have the compressed hydrogen, um, and for the small form factor, the batteries are working well and getting better. But you have a problem with long haul trucks and trains, which Trains are already electric, right? The motor that drives the train, the tractor, the tank, the modern ones are all electric motors. They run diesel gensets to generate electricity to run the electric motors because they have uh, maximum torque to their RPM. So it's like the best way to build a tank or, or heavy equipment um, motor or system. But you still have diesel gensets just to get enough energy density for the liquid fuel to be able to you know, move it all around. So hydrogen and the hydrogen fuel cell for those heavy I never thought about it until today, but that may be the place for that to happen to the bottom of the zone. Why would you ever want to go to a refueling station? 
have to. And then the cat and mouse game of why start that when there's better solutions already available. So I think the last question is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike Moody, um, can you comment on open source? <laughs> Is there any questions? Oh, that's right. That's where I left my email. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Yes, I wonder if the context space, um, the methods that you see that you invest and that you like possible are they idea stage or prototype stage or customer That's stage? a good question. Because it looks that it's, it's not like a consumer internet. It's not something that you view overnight or, you know, on the next Oh, you're saying in the clean tech space. In the clean tech right. That's a good question. It's varied a bit by industry. I mean, like subsectors. There's very different sectors. So, like in water purification, most of the solar shells and most of the battery companies is the prototype stage that we were looking at. Endeavor needed to We dabbled in some later stage components, but it's not because we had to do that stage. It's a fundamental insurance innovation. You know, nanostructured cathodes and batteries and things where. I'm not sure we continue to do as many as we have in that area, but we did dabble in, you know, we've well, done a handful of investments in things like new triple junction solar cells or, you know, 